Hello and welcome to this little island amid the ocean that YouTube is. Considered as a success, the Portuguese approach to drug decriminalization has inspired many to explore innovative ways of tackling drug abuse. But in what does decriminalization consist of and how does the Portuguese approach differ and innovate? Let's start by assessing the difference between legalization and decriminalization. As per explained by the Beckley Foundation, the legalization is where the legislature of a particular country formally amends its laws to end the prohibition of the possession, use or distribution of any of the currently controlled drugs. Whereas decriminalization is where a country retains its laws on drug offenses, but either through an agreed policy change or through new guidance to prosecuting authorities, decides to respond to certain of these offenses through administrative processes rather than the criminal justice system. In many cases, administrative penalties for drug offenses have actually been harsher than criminal sanctions, so decriminalization cannot always be seen as a less punitive approach to drug use. Yet, depenalization is where a country decides to cease punishing those involved in the possession, use or distribution of drugs. Laws will still exist prohibiting these activities and offenders may still be arrested, but no sanctions, criminal or administrative, are applied. And the changes in Portugal are an example of decriminalization as drug use, possession and acquisition are still prohibited under the law. On December 9, 1924, we find the first drug-related legislative publication in Portugal. Yet, the phenomenon of use and abuse of psychotropic products and narcotic substances began in the 70s and with it the first steps towards creating a public response to the problem started. As the drug use-related problems continued to worsen, private responses began to appear. And in 1984, the Anonymous Families was created to help the family members of people with substance abuse disorders. Then, in 1986, the first Narcotics Anonymous group was created. A year later, the Ministry of Health would open in Lisbon the Type of Center for Treatment of Drug Addiction. That same year, the VIDA program would be launched, containing 30 measures such as an open line for abstinence-based counseling and prevention initiatives for school, but also measures to fight drug trafficking. Nonetheless, it would only be in the 1990s that the theme became a central issue. The severity and visibility of heroin use brought the public and policymakers' attentions to the matter. By the mid-1990s, 1% of the population was addicted to heroin. In 10 years, deaths by overdose quadrupled, reaching 400 deaths per year. In 1999, one in every 200 people aged between 15 and 49 years was HIV positive, the highest incidence rate in Europe. Drug use also became increasingly visible with the open-air drug markets. A report from the European Council in 2000 showed the drug trade flourished in the Portuguese prison system. The report data combined with the direct experience from health and justice professionals led to the realization of the ineffectiveness of a repression or abstinence-based strategy. The fact that addiction intimately affected politicians' constituencies, if not directly their own families, and that powerful groups such as part of the church, doctors and judges backed policy change reinforced policymakers' motivation to act. By becoming the number one concern of the Portuguese population, policymakers were not only allowed but demanded to take action. The Portuguese Parliament created in 1995 the Commission for the Monitoring of the Situation of Drug Addiction and Trafficking in Portugal, and the scientific journal Revista Toxicodependencias was launched. In June 1997, public forums were organized with representatives from 15 EU members and experts on the matter from all around the world. In this scenario, innovative solutions were discussed, and with the Portuguese economy booming between 1997 and 1999, the budget for drug policy doubled. Then, in 1998, the government created the Commission for the National Strategy to Combat Drugs, composed of experts such as physicians, psychiatrists and psychologists. Its mission was to propose guidelines for a new policy for drugs and drug addiction that respected the international commitments, such as the UN Conventions on Illicit Drugs. The Commission's research concluded that the war on drugs was a failed international strategy and that responses in the health domain were insufficient or inadequately connected with the justice system. The expert groups problematized drug addiction as a disease 
and the state was assumed to have the responsibility to uphold the drug addict's constitutional right to health and the avoidance of social exclusion, without prejudice to his or her individual responsibility. In 1998, the National Strategy to Combat Drugs was presented by the Commission. It was built upon eight structuring principles which included prevention, humanism and pragmatism in its approach. It called for the decriminalization of all drug use and the state provision of a system guaranteeing treatment, social reintegration, through positive discrimination and prevention policies targeting risk groups. The fact the committee report was publicly available on the web allowed hundreds of copies to be distributed to a variety of public and private entities involved in the drug field, allowing its open discussion and refinement. Public hearings with a large attendance were organized throughout the country and attended by the members of the committee. Finally, the National Council for Drug Addiction, a consultative body including organizations representing civil society involved in the subject, was also heard. In 1999, the National Strategy to Combat Drugs was adopted by the government and in that same year, the Institute for Drugs and Drug Addiction, which was responsible for collecting data, providing information to the general public, and fostering professional training in the scope of drug-related issues was opened. In October 2000, the decriminalization was approved with only the right wings voting against. Thus, drug consumption and possession were decriminalized but not legalized. People using drugs would be identified by police authorities, have the drugs seized and be directed to a commission for the dissuasion of drug addiction. In 2001, the government would approve the decree law number 183 2001, which recognized that it was the state's responsibility to provide programs to tackle drug addiction, therapeutic responses to addiction, drug use prevention and arm reduction measures. Besides regulating the practices already in use, it also allowed new programs and defined the public-private partnerships. Despite the International Narcotics Control Board's disapproval of the Portuguese drug policy, the government counter-argued the law respected the UN conventions as drug consumption was not legalized and resisted the board's pressure to revert the measure. During the two years following the introduction of the policy, the health situation had improved significantly. The percentage of people with drug use disorders among AIDS cases fell by 17% and deaths related to drug use declined by 59% just between 1999 and 2003. These data were collected every year by national and European drug agencies that published evaluative reports, hence providing transparent evaluation and accountability mechanisms. In 2004, although still not fully endorsing it, the ENCB recognized the policy as compatible with the UN principles. In 2015, the president of ENCB would consider Portugal as a model of best practice. In 2021, the first supervised drug consumption facility opened in Lisbon, and later, in August 2022, a facility opened in Porto. Analyzing the Portuguese situation shows that the decriminalization is not the only factor on the fall of most problematic forms of drug use, but rather that improving the social and health policies alongside the decriminalization is key to success. Since its implementation, drug users apprehended by police for personal drug use or possession are referred within 72 hours to the local commissions for the dissuasion of drug use. Police cannot arrest the users, but can dispose of any drugs found, take the offender's name and address, and forward this information to the CDT. Composed of social workers, legal advisors and medical professionals, as well as supported by a team of technical experts, the three member panels of the CTDs, after receiving referrals from the police, assess each case according to the type of drug, the level of drug use, whether the use was in public or private, and the economic circumstances of the offender. The sanctions applied to the individual can include community service, fines, suspension of professional licenses, and banning from designated places. During its assessment, the CDT also recommends what they consider to be appropriate treatment or education for the offender. The Portuguese approach was one of differentiating between the user and the dealer, the former seen as an ill person in need of care and the second as a delinquent. Yet it made no distinction between soft and hard drugs and despite decriminalization of the use, since 2008 the country has had an increasing number of people criminally sanctioned for it. As concluded by Hego et al, 
the PDPM has not proven influential enough to emancipate drug use from the stigma that associates it with either crime or pathology, where it is somehow captive. The analysis carried out allows the conclusion that the PDPM is marked by anachrisms, ambiguity and modest ambition, which reveals the remnants of arguments that see drug use through the lenses of transgression, whether in illegal or health terms. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video and found the information useful, please leave a like and consider subscribing. See you next time. Stay safe.